Ronnie Goldman is working on a great book, Conservative Claims of Cultural Oppression, and talks about how the, the liberal left dominates the high ground in culture and dominates the, the high ground in narrative creation. And left liberalism is not just a political orientation, it's a total worldview. It's a way of life that's crept into the American psyche and can be discovered in your workplace, in your classroom, in the trifles of social life and pop culture. And it seems to be suffocating a right-wing perspective from all sides. And it's not that uh, liberalism is primarily sustained by reason and by argument, more by the mores and pieties that liberals have quietly entrenched as the unquestioned, taken-for-granted background of things, that civil rights are only good, that we're on this progressive march forward to give people more and more rights and human dignity, while from a non-liberal perspective, uh, you can't give any group rights, additional rights, without taking away rights from other people. So from a realist perspective, the world is not moving forward. Right? The, the human condition is simply circling. Right? So from a non-liberal perspective, right, the, the left-wing liberal parochial ethos that envelops us has progressively indoctrinated by small, often imperceptible increments. And so in making loud, strident claims of cultural oppression, conservatives seek to awaken their fellow Americans to this otherwise hidden reality. So the disciplines and repressions of the liberal left perspective, right? This idea of the buffered identity that we can create reason, purpose, meaning, and, and a way forward on our own solely through the use of our own reason and that we don't have to be contaminated by what's going on next door to us, right? From, from a non-liberal perspective, this is the achievement of a historically unprecedented degree of self-possession, self-control, and self-transparency, right? That, that's the liberal perspective, right? It's the liberation of essential human faculties from the traditional illusions which a benighted past shackled us with. But this self-congratulatory enlightenment narrative, so one way of defining the enlightenment is that there are facts and that we should be guided by them, right? But from a non-liberal perspective, we see this enlightenment narrative concealing a darker, more complicated story that reveals the coercion that the left and liberalism uses and then describes as liberation and awareness. So for the center-left and the left, right, civil rights are only liberation and an extension of human dignity throughout society, while from a traditional perspective, the civil rights legislation of 1965 and after that has completely redefined the U.S. Constitution and removed or reduced rights to private property and freedom of association and devastated social cohesion and social trust and the ability of Americans to trust one another and to live together in peace and has vastly incentivized litigation and brought government intervention into more and more intimate parts of our lives. So liberalism sees its perspective on life as kind of autonomous self-possession, as the internalization of these certain restraints and inhibitions of a disciplined society. But uh, from a non-liberal perspective, this perspective on life is not some unvarnished rationality or lucidity as liberals want to see it. It's the result of contingent historical forces that generated it, it's a new uniformization, a new homogenization, new rationalization that uh, liberalism's enlightenment narratives want to conceal. Right? So liberalism sees its outlook on life as a psychic liberation from blind convention to traditional religious narratives. But they overlook that their perspective on life is another kind of blind convention in its own right. It's the outcome of a secularized Protestantism that uh, undergirds liberal left ideals. So liberals believe in their heart of hearts that they enjoy a more self-regulating and self-transparent form of human agency because they, through their buffered identity, are able to achieve morality and purpose and meaning through the use of their own reason, right? And that they are a higher form of human agency than that which has been attained by conservatives who are just bitter clingers lost in a hallucinatory world of imaginary cultural villains. But what liberals celebrate as their higher order rationality is in its subterranean precognitive structure another hero system, another system of collective meaning production, right? A hero system that is on par with other hero systems such as the hero system of Orthodox Judaism, Christianity, and uh, conservatism. So the conservative claim of cultural oppression is a right-wing populist ideology turned postmodern.
right? It protests liberalism not as a public philosophy, but as a meta-narrative. It's a way of thinking that is no longer recognizable as its own parochial worldview, but something that has seeped into the realm of habit, taste, and feeling without being explicitly present. And so conservatives frame this liberal duplicity in all sorts of ways, but the various conservative frames are united by a conviction that liberalism is sustained by an all-pervasive social distortion, and that this distortion must be exposed if we are to have rhetorical parity between the left and the right. So Jonah Goldberg describes this liberal denial of ideology. So liberalism presents itself as simply reason and empiricism. And Goldberg says, well, no, not so much. The liberal worldview is offensive to logic. It's culturally pernicious and infuriating. And this exasperation is fairly typical among American conservatives who find themselves perennially accused of racism and of moral and intellectual failure by those who lack the standing to condemn them. So the liberals have the acrobatic dexterity, dexterity to elude every attempt to hold them accountable and... From a conservative perspective, they've been taken in by their own performance as dispassionate rationalists and pragmatists. And conservatives are the primary threat to these performances to unmasking the parochial nature of liberal identity. Conservative conservophobia that dominates the left and liberalism is not some free-floating vice. It's not a calculated political strategy. It's a logical corollary of liberalism's basic self-understanding as somehow being above the fray of sect and ideology. So feminists understand patriarchy in a particular way. It's not just a set of political aims, but it's some kind of overarching ethos and narrative in which the explicitly political aims are only one expression, not usually the most important one. So liberalism inheres not primarily in its principles and policies, but in the precognitive, pre-reflective mores of our culture, because the liberal left dominates the high ground of our culture. So. Goldberg wants conservatives to guard against being seduced by the narrative of victimization. Even though the narrative is correct on its merits that uh, conservatives are called racists and bigots and fools and fascists every day by those who control the commanding heights of culture. But uh, Jonah Goldberg says this is counterproductive to complain. It just concedes the authority of the liberal establishment to make such claims. And uh, we should discourage conservatives from two types of unhealthy responses the burning desire to offend liberals just for kicks, and then self-hating conservatism, otherwise known as uh, compassionate conservatism. So the liberal narrative refuses to recognize the loss of social cohesion and social trust and chaos that has resulted from its growing ascendancy in pushing through, for example, civil rights legislation. So liberalism has a narrative that absorbs liberalism of responsibility for the decay of traditional values and the conventional morality and for portraying ordinary Americans as still mired in unatoned racism and thus needing liberal intervention. Right, the liberal narrative celebrates birth control as a crucial step in women's liberation. Uh, Margaret Sanger, patron saint of uh, women's liberation, she promoted birth control by hitching it to a eugenic campaign to female liberation. So in persuading women that birth control was a necessary tool for their own personal gratification, Margaret Sanger used the language of liberation to convince women not to go along with the patriarchy and she was supposedly speaking truth to power. So the problem with liberalism is not its excesses, but its fraudulence, right? That it hides its hidden tribalistic partisan impulses by operating underneath a facade of rationality and pragmatism. So the moral relativism and subjectivism of liberalism is not the transcendence of ideology, as the liberal narrative has it, but on the contrary, these are ideological weapons through which to disguise the injuries which the people of fashion inflict on ordinary people. So the latter's moral degradation augments the political and cultural capital of the left, no less than vast armies of low-wage workers augment the profits of industrialists. Right? This degradation of ordinary people is the currency of liberal ambition, just another way for the anointed to set themselves up against the benighted and their moral religious traditionalism. So our political attitudes, writes Ronnie Goldman in this great work in progress, conservative claims of cultural oppression, emerge out of synaptically encoded moral narratives, meaning that, that our brains are wired to need a narrative, to need a hero system. And we all have these narratives comprised of heroes, villains, victims, helpers, and so forth. And this is undergirded by an emotional structure which binds the dramatic structure to positive and negative emotional circuitry. So we feel anger, we feel fear, we feel relief, 
in response to developments within the drama structure, such as villainy, battle, and victory. So we feel elated when our political candidate wins. We feel depressed when he loses, right? The candidate's fate has been neurally integrated with our dopamine circuitry, which is activated by his victory and suppressed by his defeat. It's not that we are born with these narratives, but the foundations to these narratives become physically encoded in our brains quickly enough that they become the lens through which we see others and ourselves. Now, our choice of politics and candidates can change, but the deep narratives that drive our choices are resistant to change because they've been synaptically encrypted into our physiology. To the extent that we change our politics is because language has changed our brains, because the right words and the right images have strengthened some synaptic connections while weakening others to the point that political reorientation becomes possible.